So for those of you who've been waiting for it, point of sale, release, the next homework is out. The graders aren't up quite yet. Uh, tomorrow, at least task one will be up and guaranteed at least that much by the end of tomorrow. Um, hopefully tomorrow right after office hours and get that done like uh, an hour or so. I got the grader mostly ready for this, but holy crap, I was exhausted at like two in the morning and just had to crash. Uh, but the document is up for all three tasks and the application objective. For task one, I just want to talk about task one briefly uh, because this is what we'll be working on this week. There is a lot of text for task one. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but I, I just want to say that I don't think any of those pieces are overly difficult, but it can be easy to make this to, for this to feel overwhelming. So just parse through this slowly to see everything that's being asked of you. Most of the text there for task one is hint text, it's help, it's extra guidance on the thing. Uh, this could be shortened to probably half a page if it was just like to the point, this is what you have to do. Most of that text is to help you out. So just don't be too overwhelmed when you read task one. I know there's a lot going on there, a lot of words to parse through. Um, but I promise it's not overly difficult. If you understand the concepts that we talk about today, especially uh, that will be reinforced on Wednesday and Friday, it's really just the concepts for today will be the new material. Wednesday and Friday is all reinforcement uh, that you'll be good for task one. So let me briefly introduce this. Oh, I meant to replace this image. I'll have to do that tomorrow too. Um, so what we're going to build is a point of sale system or more specifically, a self-checkout. I should rename this self-checkout. Uh, a self-checkout machine where customers can go up with their items at a store and purchase those items. We're going to simulate that, the software for that. Uh, and the software you build will be able, would be able to go in an actual piece of hardware. We don't uh, really play with hardware in this course for logistical reasons. But you would be able to put your software in a self-checkout machine and have it work. The way this is going to work is your self-checkout machine is going to have certain inventory programmed into it, certain items that users can purchase that will have certain <coughs> barcodes attached to them as strictly numbers. Now, we don't have a physical scanner, so they're going to have to punch in the numbers. So I have 8 gigs of RAM for sale with a barcode of 123. The user is going to press 123, enter, and that should ring up on their receipt. So that's what we want to build. Admittedly, not overly complex, not too much. The GUI is given to you, just so you know, you're building the functionality. The GUI is given to you, and you'll have methods for each one of the button presses that you'll implement. What happens when enter is pressed? What should I do when number is pressed? So given that you're not building the GUI, not overly complicated. To be honest, that is something you could do in 115, building that functionality. So why is this in 116? You can't use if statements. Everything you build in this project has to be without conditionals. No if, else if, else. No way of simulating a conditional, which excludes match case, try, uh, try catch, well, do well. All those can be used to effectively build conditionals, having some of your code run conditionally based on the value of a Boolean expression fundamental to computer science, one of the first things you learn in 115, I'm saying, nope, can't do it. So how the hell are we going to build this thing? And that's what we want to learn over the next three weeks. How are we going to build this? Uh, the answer, of course, the name of the learning objective is going to be object-oriented programming. We're going to change behavior not on the, based on the value stored in our variables that are thrown into a Boolean expression, but we're going to change our behavior based on the types of objects stored in a variable. So we're going to have variables that can store multiple different types of objects and then change behavior based on the type of objects stored in a variable. Uh, to do that, first we need to know what objects are, we got to know what classes are, then we got to learn what inheritance is, and then we got to know what polymorphism is until finally we can talk about the state pattern which uses all of those concepts and which is how we're going to get a lot of variety of behavior without having to use if statements. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer up there right now. I'm not saying if statements are a bad thing. You absolutely should use if statements in your regular programming lives. But for the purposes of this assignment, it's restricted strictly just to force you to use OOP concepts for no other reason. Just if I, if 
you're not allowed to use conditionals. You have to use polymorphism to get this task done, uh, not to get this project done, specifically task three. Uh, task one and two are just carefully written, so you won't need any conditionals. Task three, you'll want conditionals, but you have to use inheritance and polymorphism in the state pattern to get around this restriction. So this restriction is forcing you into a specific paradigm that we're teaching, which is the OOP paradigm. Uh, without this restriction, you could just code the same way you did in 115 and get through the assignment without learning what you're supposed to learn. So it's a completely artificial restriction, I'll admit that, uh, but it's to force you to learn the concept that we're learning over these next three weeks. So with that, let's dive into some content, figure out how to do these. Uh, if you downloaded these slides, I like just updated them. That's why I was a few minutes late. I was trying to rush to get the last slides. I'm gonna make sure my new stuff, look at that mess. These, the memory diagrams get messy. Um, but that's why I was a few minutes late. I was finishing up that memory diagram. So let's dive into this and I can hit the right keyboard shortcut. Memory diagrams get messy, but you know what? That's what's going on in your machine. Like a, the computers do a lot for us, a lot of stuff that we don't want to do. Uh, so we're going to train these computers to do the work for us. They can deal with that mess. But you need to understand what that mess is to understand what this computer is doing for you. So, all right, objects and classes. Let's try to get through all this. Objects have state and behavior. State is the, the culminate, culmination, culmination of the variables in an object, the variables stored in the object. Now, we actually haven't seen any of these, uh, what, what I'm going to call state variables yet. Um, but objects are going to have variables, and they're going to have behavior. The behavior is all the functions attached to that object, which when they're part of an object, we call that function a method. And today we're actually going to see the difference between a function and a method. Uh, there's a subtle difference, but a very important difference. And the behavior can depend on the state of an object. So if the variables have different values, the methods can do different things. So one of the first examples we're, all, we're familiar with, we haven't thought about it in these terms yet, uh, is a string. Say we want to split a string on commas. The state of that string is the sequence of characters that it contains. It's the actual value of that string. That's its state. That's what's stored in its variable. It has an underlying array of characters as a, a state variable in that string. And then the behavior is splitting the string. Now, splitting the string, that behavior is going to depend on the current state. It's going to depend on those variables because wherever the commas are in that string, that's going to alter whatever's returned by the split method. So we're familiar with this kind of at a high fuzzy level, but we're going to break into the details and figure out exactly how that works. So we typically don't put state in objects, but we can. I'll show you one example, and then we're never going to do this again because we usually don't want to do this. Uh, but we can put state right in our object. These variables are declared outside of any of the methods of this object which makes them what I'm going to call state variables. And we can access these by saying either this, in, from inside the object, this dot x is going to access that x that's part of the object, or from outside of the object, or from outside of the object, we can say object with state dot x, object dot with state dot y. So we could have done this all along, we could have had objects that have this state inside of it. But again, we typically don't. And I'll, I'll expand on that in a bit in what we do want to do. These variables that are attached to the object that are not inside any of the methods, inside a method, they'll be local variables and they'll be destroyed with the stack frame. These variables that are attached to the object are on the heap and they'll live as long as that object lives. These such variables have many different names, instance variables, member variables, fields. One of my favorite things to call them is fields. I like that. It's a nice one syllable. In this class, I'm going to call them state variables uh, to denote what these, these variables that are attached to an object. Uh, the state variables, I think, is the most descriptive name of them because they store the state of the object. An object can have different state depending on the values of these variables. 
So state variables, very straightforward, very descriptive name. But if you hear any of these other names, and there are others as well, for some reason these have like 100 different names that different developers call them. Uh, if you hear any of those names, just know that's what they're talking about. We got to have the Discord open. If we want to access those variables from outside of the object, object with state dot behavior, object with state dot um, st uh, state, we can access those from outside of the object. Now we've done this before too. The math object, we do math dot uh, pi to access its state, math dot absolute value, math dot pow. We access the state and behavior of the math object using this syntax. So again, we're kind of familiar at some level with this stuff, um, but we haven't really dove deep to figure out actually what's going on with that. But math, technically math with a lowercase m is a Scala object that has all those methods defined in it, and we just do math dot access those methods. The state of an object can change. And it can even change from outside of that object. So over here in my other object, I'm calling object with state double x, which is going to access x and multiply it by 2. So after that's called, the state of the object has changed from x being 10 to x being 20. Then 20 is going to be printed to the screen in this program. And that's it. I'm done with objects with state. That's all I want to say about them. Every value in Scala is an object. Absolutely everything. So anything you have, any value you have in Scala, you're sitting there in IntelliJ, you have some value. I don't care what it is. Everything in Scala is an object. And you hit dot. You have an integer stored in a variable x. And you say x dot. IntelliJ is going to give you a big long list of all the state and behavior stored in that object. It's going to give you a list of all the variables and a list of all the methods that you can call on that value. You can even type just the number 7. 7 dot. 7 is a value. 7 is an object. 7 has state and behavior. And you can access all of the integer methods directly from that integer literal. Everything. So if you have anything in Scala, just put a dot after it and Explore what state and behavior it has. Everything in Scala is an object. OK, but what we really want to talk about is classes. That's what I want to spend a long time on. Uh, and we will actually have objects with state. There's a, a little bit of a, a misspeak. But we won't do it the way we saw it right there. We're going to use classes instead of the object keyword in Scala. So classes, this is what. OOP is all about, this is kind of the starting point, the fundamental thing about OOP is creating classes which will be used to create objects. Oh, but I'm still talking about objects in the slide. Slide, keep up with me, come on. So classes are going to be used to create objects. So instead of just declaring one object with state like we did in the, the last thing, creating one object, pale blue dot, uh, what we often want are lots of objects with different state of the same, with similar behavior. And that's where we're going to bring in classes. So classes are going to be used as templates to create multiple objects instead of creating just one object with the object keyword. We're going to create a class, then we're going to use that class to create objects. And when we do this, we call it, say that it's instantiated. We're going to instantiate an object from that class. I'm not going to dwell on that vocab too hard. Um, but we'll be able to create new objects from a class. Then objects are called instances of that class. The vocab is a big rabbit hole in computer science. Um, but we're going to create objects using that class. When we create a class, we're defining a brand new type in Scala. It's like int, float, long, uh, map, list, array. These are all types in Scala. 
we're going to start creating classes which defines brand new types that we can use. We can pass them as arguments in our method calls. We can use them as parameters in our method definitions. Uh, we can have them as return values for methods. Anytime we can use any type, we can use our new class types. All right, so let's see an example. We're going to create a class that we can create a bunch of objects from. Let's do this with an example. I'm going to create a player class, like a player in a game that's going to have two kind of things that it can keep track of, I guess three. Its position as XY coordinates as two doubles, a max number of hit points, the current number of hit points, and how much damage they can inflict on other players when they attack. So just a, a you know, bare bones stats, very simple game, simple enough to fit on a slide. Uh, and let's see, how would we create such a player class? And that's how. Uh, don't worry, we're going to spend the rest of lecture on this example. Uh, I know I'm throwing a lot of code at you with one slide. So we're going to define a class. Instead of using the object keyword, we're going to use the class keyword. We're going to say, Scala, give me a, I'm creating a class named player. And here's all the definition of the player class, which will be used to create player objects using the new keyword. I'm going to say, give me a new player. I have two objects, player one, player two, of type player in my code now. So let's go through this piece by piece. So first thing we see, well, I don't know what the first thing you saw was, but first thing I want to talk about is that we have five variables that are declared inside of this class that are not in any of the behavior methods. So we have three variables declared up here in this strange syntax up here, x location, y location, max hit points, and then two more variables declared hanging out out here outside of all the methods with the same syntax that we saw with the object example. So all these variables, these five variables, are all going to become the state variables of this object. So this will be part of its state, all of its state variables. This is what's going to control that for a player. And I'll revisit this, this notation. Uh, and then we have the behavior. So the state in those five variables, and now the behavior in these four methods. This is going to define how a player object behaves. These are the four methods that can be called on, player, on objects of type player, on any player object. We can call these methods on those objects which are all going to do various things, uh, things we want to do in games, move the player around, attack other players, uh, take damage, and check if we're still alive or not. Did we game over or not? Uh, you don't understand how pale blue dot... Oh, Nicholas has got you anyway. Uh, so when we... If we want to write a program, we'll create uh, the program as an object and then put a main method in that object. And give, uh, that gives us a starting point for our programs. Now, our programs can use classes, but like in a class, we can't put a main method. I can't put a main method in this thing. So if I want to write a Scala program, I need at least one object that's going to store that main method as our jumping off point. Uh, for pale blue dot, since we haven't talked about any OOP stuff before, we just jam everything in one big object, define all the behavior in there, and put the main method in the same object. Uh, just so I can say, all of your code goes in pale blue dot dot scout. It's not necessarily the right thing to do or the best thing to do. Uh, but at that point in 116, we like to keep things as simple as possible. For homework two, you're going to create all kinds of classes. You're going to have at least 10 files in your submission by the time you're done, uh, by the time you get done with task three. And most of those, for those of you who are upset about pale blue dot, I, I understand this complaint, and we do this for a reason. Pale blue dot, like, the structure's all given to you. We get all the method headers. You get everything there. It's just filling in the methods. Uh, for project two, you're not going to feel that way. Some of it's given to you, just enough structure to make sure that the GUI runs when you first clone the code. Uh, but a lot of it, you're going to be creating new classes. 
You're going to be creating, uh, writing your own methods. You'll even be naming some of your own classes that Autolab doesn't even, isn't even aware of. Uh, you're going to be creating a lot of your own structure for this next project and the other ones as well. Yeah, Scala object is just like a static class in Java. It's like a, a Java, well, I'll correct a little bit of that. It's like a Java class with nothing but static members. All the state and behavior is all static. A static class is used for inner classes. You can have a static inner class, but you can have a static class at the top level of a package. Uh, for the 99% of you who don't know what I just said, for, don't, don't think about it. Forget about it. Um, so, this, what I kind of glossed over, yeah. Yes. The variables declared outside, like outside of the methods, but inside of the class, they have a global scope, so they can, can they? They have object scope, so they'll be, ex be able to be accessed if you have a reference to the object that was created, uh, but they don't have global scope, like you can't have a main method that just jumps right into player.hp. That wouldn't be allowed. But if you create a new player, then you could do player1.hp like we do here. You can access it there, but you have to have a reference to an object of that type first. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, to have global scope, when we had the object example, that did have global scope. You could do object with state dot whatever from anywhere in your code as long as you import that object. Uh, like you can, in anywhere in your code, you can do math.py to get the pi constant. That's, it's kind of global scope. It's still like, it's not strictly global because you can't just do pi, but, um, but it's effectively global. Uh, but these ones are not. You have to have a reference to an object. Uh, so this guy right here, I kind of glossed over and said we'd revisit it. Let's talk about this because this is a very important point. This is called the classes constructor. This is actually a method definition. This is a method named player, and we call this method using the new keyword, which we'll do when we get over to the other side here, uh, which would be a, a main method. I, I cut off the top and bottom, but this is, I have this in a test. I think it's called player test in the repo. Uh, you can see that snippet of code. You can see the full example. So this constructor is going to be used to create objects of type player. And that's what we're after is objects. We want the objects of type player. So when we call the constructor, when we create a new player, we're saying we have to provide a double for the x location, a double for the y location, and an int for the max hit points whenever we create a new player class. These variables in the constructor automatically become state variables, just like these variables declared outside of the constructor. They'll automatically become state variables. This is something where if you're coming from any other language, uh, I, I don't know of another language that does it quite like this, uh, but if you're coming from Python, Java, C++, JavaScript, anything, uh, it's going to be slightly different than this. You'll have to take the parameters of the constructor and assign them to state variables. Scala says, let's skip, let's cut out a few steps there. Your constructor parameters just become state variables. They just are state variables automatically. Saves so a little bit of redundant typing. Yeah, the, this will have to be either in the same package, this code and this class, or I have to import player. In this case, I imported player, I believe. I forget how my package structure is set up, uh, but it's in the repo. Inside the constructor, you have three options for declaring your variables. Val and var. Val can't be changed. Var can be changed. We've, we're familiar with those. You also have a third option of not using either val or var. If you don't use val or var, your state variable will behave like a value. It can't be changed but it also can't be accessed from outside the class. So over here where we're doing player1.hp, this is fine because h, no, oh, that's not a constructor parameter. But if we did player1.max hit points, uh, that would be allowed because we use val for max hit points and we can access that value. 
If we didn't use val or var, if we just said max hit points of type int, we wouldn't be able to access that from outside of this file. Over here, we wouldn't be able to say player one dot max hit points. So if you see that bug in your code, you can't access your variables from outside of the class. Uh, take a look at what you use to declare those variables in the constructor. Did you use val or var, or did you forget to use either of them, like it's a regular method call, uh, and didn't use either of them, and then you can't access your variables. So watch out for that if you can't access your state variables from the constructor. And we see this new word, this, littered all over the code. We saw it once earlier in these slides, but this is where I really want to talk about it. We see this keyword, this, all over the place, just sprinkled all over this thing. Whenever we see this inside a method call, or even in the constructor area, this dot max hit points, this contains a reference to the calling object. Whatever object called the method, that's what's stored in this is a reference to that, to that object. Ooh. So when we say player two dot attack player one, in the attack method, this is a reference to whatever player is stored in player two. Can I plug in my laptop? So this is always a reference to the object that's calling the method. Or in the case of the constructor, it's a reference to the object that's being created, just kind of like the object that's calling the constructor. So this is a reference to that object. It is not the object itself. Hopefully, we're all comfortable with that. It's not the object itself. It's a reference to it. Actually, I only gave one example of that, did I, with the array? Come on, get in there. And now that we have a brand new type, we declared, we defined a brand new type named player. And we can use that type anywhere in our code. Anywhere where we can use something like int. If we want an array of players, we can do that. Anywhere where we can use something like int or double, we can use player now, including a parameter type like we have here. We can say other player of type player. That's saying this type here. And then other player, we can access its state and behavior. We're going to access its take damage method, pass it a value saying I'm dealing this much damage to this player. And then this method is called with that other player as this. So this here is going to be the other player, which will make more sense when we get to that memory diagram. Is there a way to declare class variables as public private? I, I really got to look up this answer. So I forget. I, I believe those do exist in Scala, but they're discouraged. We don't really use them in this language. The community doesn't. Um, aside from just leaving off your val or var, like if this, I delete this, then max hit points is a private variable. It can only be accessed within that class, the same as a private variable in other languages. But these variables down here, I don't know if we have a mechanism. If I do private var HP, I've never done it in Scala, and it's just not a Scala thing to do. But I don't know if it technically exists in the language or not. <coughs> so it does exist? OK. I'll put a big uh, maybe. I, I always forget to, to look into that. Like if you like if we were teaching this class, if I'm teaching this class in Java, you're gonna hear me say the words public, private, protected. I'm gonna say that stuff all the time. And default, uh, I'll talk about access modifiers because it's a very Java thing to do to use access modifiers. The Java community loves access modifiers. Scala community not so much. I'm gonna to conform to the community of whatever language I'm currently teaching. Scala, the Scala community just doesn't use access modifiers, so uh, so I'm not gonna use them in my Scala code. Just like in Java, you're gonna see getters and setters all over the place. That's not a Scala thing to do. Scala has a different solution to that problem. Uh, so you won't see getters or setters at all either. So if you're coming from Java and you're concerned about the lack of all that stuff, it's strictly because this is Scala. I've taught in Java before, and I'd be saying getters and setters, accessors, mutators, private and public. I'd be saying all that stuff. Always, always, always set your fields to private. That's something I'll say when I'm teaching in Java. Uh, it's differences of languages. And I say community, but there are really fundamental differences in the languages that make those things acceptable in one language and not in another uh, that I'm not getting into in depth right now. Right now.
So we define our player class, and we want to create objects of this type. We're going to say new, and then call the constructor. Constructor is a method. It's a method named player that takes these parameters. I'm going to call that new player, give it the parameters, and that's going to return a reference, a reference, not the object, a reference to the object. Where can we find this in memory? That's what it's going to return. Where's that memory address of where we can find this object? And then we can access the state and behavior. So each of these variables has their own copies of all these five state variables. They don't share any state. They have the same variable names, but player one and player two have their own copy of all five of these state variables. Just like if you create two lists, you wouldn't expect those lists to have all the same values. Same thing here. We don't expect these players to have the same current HP at any given time, the, current, uh, the HP at any given time. Uh, we don't expect those to be the same. We don't expect every player in our game to have the same exact location. They can all have their separate location variables. So we've seen a lot of classes so far. Int, double, boolean, list, array, map, all classes. For what it's worth, list, map, and array, the three classes we've seen where we had objects stored on the heap, we never use the keyword new. Strange. So the way these ones, these classes are set up, we don't use the keyword new. We actually call an apply method and a companion object. We don't need to get into all that. Uh, but when you call this method, this ends up calling new, new list internally. But it's a different method. You're not calling the constructor directly. You're calling a helper method that will then call the constructor. So it's a little bit different setup, but we're doing the same thing. You can think of this as saying new list, but if you do new list, you're going to get errors in your code. Uh, but it's the same thing. We're creating an object of type list and then storing a reference to that object in the variable named list. We could set up our stuff like that, but there's really no need to. It's just an extra step, and it's more confusing. Uh, so I'd rather just say, yeah, these are special. We don't use new. All right, let's get to the big show. Let's do this memory diagram in uh, 15 minutes. What exactly is an instance variable? Uh, so you can use that interchangeably. I call them state variables in this class because I want to make it very clear that they store the state of the object. Uh, but instance variable is the same thing as a state variable. When I say state variable, if you want to think instance variable, uh, uh, what was the other one? Field, and I forget what the other one I put on the slide was. Um, but if you want to think any of the other terms, it's perfectly fine. You'll hear those other terms used out there in the world. Uh, so uh, maybe I should. No, I, I shouldn't. I had to pick one. I, I like being consistent in the course so you always know what I'm talking about. So I picked one and I picked state variable. Uh, Paul might have picked a different one for what it's worth. If you watch his lectures and he says instance variable or field, uh, just know that we're talking about the same thing. All right, so I made slight changes to the code, to uh, mostly just to fit things on the slide. Like instead of x location, I just put x because I don't want to fill up my my uh, memory diagram right away with variable names. So slight changes, and I cut down what's going on here. I created a third player variable, and I cut it down to just one method call because the memory diagram was getting real messy. So I had to cut it down. Plus, it was like two minutes before lecture. And my answer was delete a bunch of the code and call it done. Uh, but I was at the bottom of the screen. You'll see, we'll get, we'll get down here and we'll fill up the heap. So I can't really fit the other things anyway. Uh, but this example, uh, I don't think I mentioned this in lecture, but at the top of the website, the course website with all the links, there's another one there with a PDF to help you with memory diagrams. The last example in that PDF is a more full example of this. It has uh, just more lines. It's more closer to what we saw in the previous slides. So if you want the full thing, you do have an example there. All right, let's go through this program, though. We got our stack split into name and value. We got our heap. We got our in out. This program doesn't print anything to the screen, so I just jammed it in the corner there. Let's do this. 
syntax in memory diagrams for objects, custom objects that we wrote the classes for on the heap. So this is something for your LO2 quiz you'll certainly have to do. For your LO1 quiz, it's just going to be one array on the heap for one of the questions. For your LO2, you better believe we're going to throw all kinds of stuff like this at you. You'll have to put your custom objects on the heap. So in uh, three more weeks, uh, this is what you'll be doing on the quiz. So we're going to create a new player object on the heap. Whenever you see this keyword new, whenever you see new, and even sometimes when you don't in the cases of arrays, lists, and maps, whenever you see new, you know something brand new is going on the heap. So I see new, new player. I know a new player is going on the heap. I'm thinking that right away. I'm drawing that new object on the heap. If you don't see new, like for your own classes, at least for the player class, we'll stop thinking about the data structures. If you don't see new, you're not creating a new player on the heap. So just to foreshadow that a little bit, we have three variables of type player, but we only see new twice. We're only going to have two players on the heap. So how do we resolve that in our brains, that we're going to have three variables of type player, but only two players on the heap? That's one of the big concepts we need to understand, how references work, which is one of the big things I want to talk about in this example. Actually, there's a lot I want to talk about in this example. Classes come at you fast in this, in this course. So we're going to call the constructor. The constructor is a method. So we're going to put a stack frame on the stack. We're going to put the parameters on the stack x, y, and max hp, but we also have an extra implicit parameter. It's kind of a hidden parameter that isn't super clear in your code that this happens, but whenever you call a method, we should be, we should be, I want to move this green arrow up there. Whenever we're in the method, a method, which we're in a method call of the constructor, we get an extra parameter under the keyword this, which stores a reference to the calling object, whatever object called that method. In the case of a constructor, it's a reference to the object that's being created. So if I'm creating this player class and I made up a number 982, uh, creating a player at memory address 982, this is going to store that reference 982 referring to that player that's being created. Not the object itself. That's a very important point. Not the object itself, but a reference to the object. Once the constructor is called, we get these constructor variables automatically become state variables in the object, and then any code that's outside of all the methods is just kind of hanging out there and, and uh, out in the, my, my brain's not working. Uh, just pretend I said something clever there, I guess. So any of the code outside of all the methods is going to be executed when the constructor is called. So these two lines of code are going to be executed we have this.maxhp. So whenever we have this, we have a reference to the calling object. We're going to follow that reference. Dot means I know you're a reference, but I don't care about you. I care about whatever you refer to. The dot means let's head over to the heap and check out whatever you refer to. So we have a reference in this. We're going to say, let's go to the heap and check out max HP. This dot max HP is 10. We're going to declare a new variable named HP. Anything declared out here is going to be a new state variable in the object. So we're going to create a new state variable HP and set it equal to that 10. We're going to create another state variable named damage, set it equal to 4. Those all go in the heap. 
inside the player object. So we have an object of type player at some memory address in the heap. We have a reference to that memory address, and we have five state variables inside that object. That object can store, and if we have a reference to that object, we can access that state using the dot operator. Constructor ends, we get to the end of it. It returns to the variable that we're assigning to, player one. And what it returns is the reference to the object that was created. So whatever this was, whatever was being created, whatever number I just made up, that reference is being returned. So player one, the only thing player one stores is this reference, this memory address. Where can I find this object of type player? And that reference can be used to actually access the state and behavior of this player. Player two, we do the same thing. I'm not going to go through all the, the same steps again. But we do the same thing. Call the constructor, pass the parameters, get an implicit this, create the five state variables. I made up the number 576 this time and return that to player two, a reference 576 to that player object. Now when we get to player three, uh, I have to skip that slide. I knew there would be a mistake somewhere in here. When we get to player three, I'm saying player three equals player one. I'm not creating a new player. There's no keyword new, so nothing new is going on the heap. Whenever we see an assignment like this, we look at the variable. What does player one store? It just stores this. Whatever is in its value column, that's what it stores, and that's what's assigned. So player three gets that reference of player one, stored in player one, which is a reference to this object on the heap. And keep in mind, the objects in the heap don't have any names. We kind of think of them as player one, player two, player three. But those are only the names of the variables that store references to those objects. They don't actually have any names in the heap. So player one and player two right here both refer to the same object. Then we're going to do player two dot attack player one. How do we handle this? Intuitively, I think you can tell what, what's happening. Player two is attacking player one and is going to deal four damage. Player one is going to have six HP. But let's take a look at what's happening in memory to see exactly how this is, uh, how this is pulled off. So first, we're going to add a stack frame for the attack method. Since player two is calling the method, the reference stored in the variable player two is what's going to be passed to the keyword this. This stores a reference to the calling object. Player two called this method, so we get a reference to the value in player two. And then other player, player one, player one is this reference. Other player is going to be that reference 982. And we call other player dot take damage. Other player, and we're going to just look at our stack, uh, our stack frame here. Other player stores a reference 982. Happens to refer to this player. So when I say other player dot call a method, access your behavior, when I create that take damage stack frame, this is going to get a reference to 982, the calling object. This dot damage in the attack stack frame, attack this 560, uh, 576, Damage is four. It happens to be the same, so even if you followed the wrong one, you'd get the right answer in this case, but we want to understand what's happening. It would be this damage right here. And then we're going to take some damage. This dot HP in the take damage stack frame, this is 982, which is this object. Take uh, minus equals damage. Damage is four. So we're going to follow this dot HP, this dot HP minus four, and that updates to six. Stack frames are over, destroyed, destroyed. And we're at the end of our main method. Oops. 
we're at the end of our main method, but at this point, the important thing to note, player one took damage and has six HP, right? What's the HP of player three? Six. I heard it, I heard it a bunch out there, good. I'm glad, this is something that tricks students up every semester, yeah. Uh, for the for the box zero times zero x nine eight two like would mm -hmm. cost cross out the ten HP like on the paper? Or, or oh the yes, you're right. Yes, this should be cross. This should say ten crossed out and then six. Thank you. I have to update these slides. Like I rushed right at the last minute there, so there are a few little things. I'll, I'll have to touch these up later today. Yeah, that should be ten crossed out and then six. And then I have the one slide where I have player three with the wrong reference. So player one and player three both refer to the same object. They're both at six HP. And we're definitely not getting to the demo. But we are getting to this. And once you're done with the lecture question, you're free to go. I hope you have a great day and see you Wednesday. Make sure I have the right lecture question. Let's store it in the keyword this. I think I said it enough times this lecture. I hope I did. And we got two joke answers here, so you got a one out of three even if you didn't listen. Hopefully everybody, I'd like to see everyone get this one.